Are you Bowan? Good afternoon, everyone. A very good afternoon to you all from Colombo, Sri Lanka. My name is Lakshita. The architecture of Sri Lanka exhibits a very rich diversity. Sri Lanka, a country with 2,500 year old documented history, ancient architecture can still be found, studied, and admired by local and international scholars, as well as travelers around the world. From the Anuradhapura era dating back to the 4th century BC, to Sigiriya 5th century AD, Polonarua 11th century AD, Kandy 16th century AD, and then the foreign influence of Portuguese 16th century, Dutch 17th century, and British 18th century AD, the architectural found in Sri Lanka is enthralling. If we have to talk about architecture in these different eras, we will definitely have to do a lot more webinars solely concentrating about historical architecture. Objective of today's webinar is to touch upon lesser known sites which have architectural values that can be informative and educational for both local and foreign travelers. I told you our lecture exhibits a very rich diversity. So as our expert panel today, First, let me introduce to you Dr. Nilan Kure. Dr. Kure is a chartered architect and a heritage conservationist by profession. He obtained his undergraduate and postgraduate training in both architecture and conservation from University of Morocco in Sri Lanka. He holds a PhD from Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands for his research on landscape design of Sigiriya. Dr. Kure has more than 30 years of experience in conserving architectural heritage in various capacities in Sri Lanka and overseas. Currently, he is leading a team of consultants to conserve and establish interpretive presentation of the historic fortification at Gold Fort, funded by the World Bank, and he serves as the Secretary General of the National Trust in Sri Lanka. Please also allow me to introduce to you Mr. Chandra Daswatta. Mr. Daswatta graduated from the University of Moratua and did his postgraduate diploma in architecture and master of architecture in advanced architectural studies at the University of London. After graduation, he joined the architectural consultancy of Deshamanya Jeffrey Bawa, who was one of the most influential Asian architects and was involved in several projects, including the world famous Kandalama Hotel and design for a new official residence for the president of Sri Lanka. Mr. Daswatta, from 2015 to 2019, held the position of chairman of the Gaul Heritage Foundation. He is a trustee of the Jeffrey Bawa and Lunuganga Trust and found a founding member of the Museum of Modern and Com Contemporary Art. He has dedicated his spare time to being a lecturer and a year person at the Colombo School of Architecture and a senior lecturer at the university. He's a visiting lecturer at, and an examiner at this institute. Uh, first, let's start with Dr. Kure. Sir, you are someone who has traveled both locally and internationally and researched extensively about the history of architecture and different types of architecture. Can you briefly explain to our viewers, sir, features that you see is significantly different to that exist in Sri Lanka compared to the other parts of the world? Okay, uh, okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, actually, um, actually, the uh, the architecture of Sri Lanka is, uh, in my opinion, uh, is more landscape driven than uh, the building design driven. Uh, that means it doesn't uh, dominate uh, over the landscape, uh, and it is an architecture that is inspired by nature uh, and respecting the natural setting on which it is built. Right. Uh, the Sigiri is the best example in this regard uh, and also it adopts uh, the natural elements like uh, the, the, the cave shelters uh, rather than uh, excavating into the, uh, the, the structures like you know like in India where you get uh, Ajanta, Ellora and other sites uh, where the, the builders uh, they excavate the caves to uh, uh, make them for their own habita habitable areas. But in Sri Lanka, we are not doing such things, but we are just uh, using the natural elements uh, and uh, do a little bit uh, to uh, make it part of the architecture. Um, and even the monumental architecture, like uh, uh, let's say stupas, they are 
very high in scale, but they are harmonious, uh, uh, you know, the profile with the domes, they actually not dominate over the landscape like uh, the ones that, uh, you know, the, in the, um, Egypt where you have very sharp lines for the pyramids and all. So um, it's a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, an architecture which is, uh, I mean, uh, inspired by nature. And also there is a proportional rep uh, relationship that that is derived from the natural elements. So that means the, the harmony is always there with uh, uh, the, the nature. Uh, so that means uh, it is a, 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 a architecture that is more related and respecting uh, the nature. So that is my view of uh, Sri Lankan architecture. Right, okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, now I would like to uh, turn to uh, Mr. Chandra Daswatta. Sir, you are a student of Deshamane Jeffrey Bhava, one of the most renowned architectures that we have had in Sri Lanka. When it comes to modern and contemporary architecture, obviously he was one of the best in Asia. Can you briefly explain to our viewers how Jeffrey Bhava managed to bring these amazing creations and how his work influenced you to become one of the best architectures that we have in Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you, Lakshita. Uh, I don't know about the last statement, but uh, certainly um, uh, working with Mr. Bawa was a huge inspiration. And as uh, Dr. Kure, Nilan, my friend Nilan pointed out to you, the architecture of Sri Lanka is really about the landscape. And in fact, an architecture that doesn't dominate the landscape. And one of the key elements of Jeffrey Bawa's work uh, and what made his work so significant was that the landscape, it, it, he carried on that wonderful tradition uh, that Dr. Kure pointed out uh, of an architecture that is of the landscape and not one that dominates the landscape. Uh, so, so that particular kind of modernism, uh, which Bhava practiced, uh, Jeffrey Bhava practiced was, was what I think eventually uh, gave him a lot of the fame that he had as an architect. Uh, way back from the 19, I mean, he, he started practicing architecture in 1957 um, after he studied at the Architecture Association, but he came to architecture essentially through landscape. He designed a garden before he was even an architect, uh, the now uh, world-renowned Lumiganga Garden, which is open to the public and uh, lots of tourists come there and great, you know, there, 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 there are crowds of people coming to see it. It's also open as a hotel um, and you can sort of experience the garden from within it. Uh, so he came to architecture through landscape and that way he was continuing the great tradition of Sri Lankan architecture, which was really about an architecture that, that became one with the landscape, blended with the landscape. Uh, and, and that was what was unique about a lot of his work. So if you look at all his work, uh, from uh, the, the, the early works like the Palantarawa guest house uh, the, and, and right towards up to the Kandalama Hotel, uh, the University of Rukuna, uh, all that work respects the landscape and the buildings begin to kind of work uh, with the landscape uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to do what it, what it, whatever it's supposed to do. Uh, so, so that way, I think that's that's very much what Jeffrey Bauer uh, contributed to contemporary Sri Lankan architecture and to contemporary world architecture. And I suppose uh, I, for one, has been hugely inspired by all of that work. Um, and uh, and my own work uh, tries to um, relate, but at least partially be inspired by it, uh, and and work towards an architecture that continues to celebrate the Sri Lankan landscape uh, and its environment. Right. Okay, now I would like to um, ask Dr. Kure. So you are a highly qualified consultant with vast experience about heritage architecture. Today we are discussing about lesser known architectural sites in Sri Lanka. Uh, I know there are so many sites that you have here, but can you please recommend to our viewers sites that you have visited and you have noticed that have immense architectural value but are not well known in Sri Lanka? Yes, uh, uh, Lakshita. So uh, I normally categorize uh, our heritage uh, architecture into three categories. I mean, one is the 
uh, the major sites like Anuradhapura, Polvannaru, uh, Sigiri, uh, Kandy, those sites, uh, which are known to everybody, especially to the locals and internationally, they are the World Heritage Sites. Then the second category is uh, the other popular sites like uh, uh, Yapahua, Gadalade, Neal, Ankhati, Lekon, uh, which are popular, popular among the, the locals and somewhat popular with uh, the, the international tourists as well. But uh, today's discussion is more on the lesser known sites, actually. That is actually the essence of the Sri Lankan architecture, um, which actually uh, it uh, provides a better understanding of the, uh, the, the cultural and architectural diversity of this uh, the island nation, uh, because it, it, it has different views and you know, characteristics. Uh, if you, uh, uh, you know, um, name, I mean, uh, identify all these things, but um, uh, there are a vast number of sites. I, I don't think uh, uh, a program like this can introduce uh, uh, so many sites uh, in a very short period, but I would like to still, I mean, just uh, uh, as a representation, we take a few examples, um, but they are, they are not, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, ordered in a, in a proper way. But uh, I will try to show you some of the sites uh, which are lesser known, but having a significant architectural value. Uh, can I see the slides? Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, one of the sites, uh, which is Pilikuttu. Uh, it is about 30, kilo, 30 kilometers uh, from Colombo on Vaturagama Road uh, of uh, Miriswat uh, on Candy Road. Uh, it has actually 99 cave shelters, right? So it is only 30 kilometers from Colombo, but it is a, a site which has a huge number of uh, cave shelters uh, and uh, its uh, history dates back from the prehistoric time. But what is more interesting is it's, it's uh, the, the, the interaction with the, the, the people. That is from third century BC, it was uh, a monastic uh, uh, habitation by the, the, the monks and uh, the, the the inscriptions are uh, the brahmi inscriptions are there but at a later period they were converted for different different other uses of the monastic community and it has uh, uh, cave temples uh, and some of them are painted uh, shrine sites uh, and it is a huge uh, um, complex which is uh, very much close to colombo uh, so that is one site then the second site uh, site I would like to uh, describe is the Richmond Castle, uh, which is in Kaluthara, uh, along the Kethahena Road from Kaluthara. It's about three kilometers. And it is a, a neo uh, Renaissance uh, uh, castle built by a Sri Lankan uh, businessman uh, overlooking Kaluganga. And it has a landscape garden, which is actually a fusion of uh, the Baroque and the English uh, revival, uh, uh, the landscape traditions. And it is a wonderful uh, place to, uh, to visit and to enjoy the real architecture um, of uh, partly colonial Sri Lankan as well. Uh, third slide, please. Uh, yeah, this is Sasservo or Rasnihara Vihara of uh, Galgamua. You can reach it uh, th through uh, via Nan area and ahead whoever. And it is also a monastic settlement from the 3rd century BC. Uh, what is significant here, uh, of course, there are several cave uh, uh, temples and they have been from the monastic times. But what is interesting here is the, 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 the colossal Buddha image. Uh, which is actually a little bit taller than even uh, Aukana Buddha image, uh, which is carved out of the living rock. It is uh, one of the tallest uh, uh, Buddha images uh, found in Sri Lanka. Uh, and then, the, of course, the cave temples, uh, the painted cave temples, yeah, you can see paintings uh, uh, from uh, the Candian period and also uh, nice. Uh, uh, the, the Bodhi tree, uh, the Bodhi Malaka. And what is interesting about this site is that uh, it, it interacts well with uh, the, the environment. And when you are there, you can see uh, the, the interaction with the nature 
and it's a real enjoyment uh, if you can visit this site. So very nice, uh, good place for meditation as well. Uh, can I see the next slide? Uh, and then uh, coming back to the colonial period, again, um, if uh, Nigambo can offer a lot of, uh, I mean, different varieties of buildings and uh, heritage uh, sites. Uh, of course, uh, we have the Nigambo Fort, but it is still, I mean, currently used as uh, a prison, but uh, still you can enjoy uh, the, the, the fortifications uh, still intact. And uh, in one of the bastions, you get uh, the St. Stephen's uh, uh, Church. It is an Anglican church, uh, one of the best uh, uh, Anglican churches. Uh, that is a neo-Gothic, uh, built in the neo-Gothic style. Uh, and also the Grand Church in uh, Nigambo. Uh, that is a Catholic church and the interior is really nice. So this is, uh, uh, I mean, likewise, there are several churches where you can visit uh, in Nikambo. Can I see the next slide, please? Uh, then the, the Dambadenia. Dambadenia is actually a capital um, uh, in the 13th century. And um, uh, actually it was a capital established uh, uh, with the uh, on top of a rock like at Sigiriya. But what is here interesting is about uh, the, the architecture that, is, that has survived from uh, that period. Uh, so one of them is uh, the, the one that you see uh, the, the, to, the, to the right is the, uh, the former uh, Tooth Relic Temple, right? uh, when uh, Dambadenia was the capital. And it actually still resembles the, the Tooth Relic Temple in uh, Kandy. Uh, the tooth relic was enshrined on the upper floor and the, um, the ground floor was used uh, uh, as an image house. But now it has uh, again converted as, as an image house. And the other interesting feature of uh, this Vijay Sundara Rama temple is uh, uh, the stupa house. Actually, it is not a Vatadage. Vatadage is a building which actually in encloses a uh, stupa, but here uh, the building has been uh, uh, constructed just to give a shelter to the roof and you can see it from outside also. So these are called the, the Kuludages in the Sri Lankan architectural tradition. And this is one of the uh, uh, examples that you can see when you visit uh, uh, the Vijay Sundara Rama. Can I see the next slide, please? Uh, yeah, uh, in Jaffna, uh, apart from seeing the fortifications, the, the, uh, the Jaffna fort and also the Kovils, uh, Jaffna also offers uh, a, a, a variety of uh, architectural uh, forms. Uh, yeah, you have the Chankili uh, residence, uh, still, it's still a, a, a building which is still intact. Uh, it is uh, the residence of a provincial king at that time, uh, before the Portuguese uh, uh, advent to uh, Sri Lanka. And also you can see the, uh, the arch entrance, uh, which is called the Sangili Topu in Jaffna, which is uh, the entrance to another uh, royal compound. And also uh, the, uh, the entrance, uh, the porch uh, of uh, the Naguleshwaran uh, Madam, which is actually a rest hall for the, um, the, 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 the Naguleshwaran temple. So likewise, there's a wide array, uh, array of uh, um, uh, architectural monuments, which you can see in Jaffna, apart from uh, the Kovils and uh, the, uh, the, the, the fort. Corte is uh, again another site which is actually in Colombo, uh, which is now the, the, uh, the administrative capital of uh, Sri Lanka. But uh, those days, uh, uh, it was also the, uh, I mean, at, uh, in the 15th century, uh, it was the, uh, the, the capital of Sri Lanka, the whole of Sri Lanka. Um, uh, unfortunately, most of the remains are not there, but still you can see uh, the, the, the plan form and the inner city and the outer city. The, uh, Atul Korte and the Pitta Korte. Korte is the Kotua, that is uh, the fort. 
right? And uh, still you can see the, the ramparts, the moats, uh, and also the marshy land, uh, the, the marshy areas uh, giving protection uh, uh, to the fort. Uh, the fort. And uh, of course, you can see the Badagana, uh, the, the, the double stupas, and also the, uh, the, 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 the ramparts. Okay, next slide. Uh, and of course, then uh, the Riti Vihara, which is again uh, uh, another cave temple complex and the painted uh, uh, site uh, where we can see uh, uh, the. Um, it, it, it also contains uh, um, paintings from uh, the 7th century uh, and 8th century as well as uh, those of the uh, 18th century. And it has uh, a cave shrine uh, and also a, a mandapa, which is constructed out of, I mean, uh, constructed in the style of the uh, uh, South Indian tradition. So those are the things that are that you can, if you go to Riddhi Vihara, it is also a wonderful site. Again, you can see the, the interaction with the nature and the culture uh, in this site. Next slide. Yeah. So that is, uh, yeah. So that is uh, again Riddhi Vihara. Uh, so here you can see to the sides to the left, uh, the bottom left, uh, where you can see the the, uh, the Hindu forms, uh, and then you have uh, Thiriyaya. Uh, this is a site which is uh, uh, north of uh, Trincomalee, and um, again constructed established eighth century. Uh, Yes, uh, and uh, the, the, again, the location is fabulous where you can see, the, I mean, you can observe the, 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 the sea from uh, this location because from this elevated location. And in, it has a stupa in the center and two concentric uh, rings actually supporting uh, the roof of that period. The next uh, slide. I would um, sorry. Um, we need to um, apologize from you all. Uh, the um, the current with the condition in in Colombo and around Colombo is not the best. So there's a lot of rain and um, and uh, there's a lot of thunder around. So Dr. Kure, can you um, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Back yes. online? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Shall, shall I go? Uh, Can we um, turn to Dr. Daswa? So these are the basic. These are basic for the today's discussion. Hmm? I think so because it's just not, uh, yeah, it's all falling apart.
we back online. Do apologize when we do um, webinars. We tend to um, face this sort of um, issues that are beyond our control. Uh, do we have Dr. Daswata online? I, I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah, you can, you can ask me. Uh, ask sir, away. Sir, yeah, sir. Just want to uh, want to ask you, sir. When it comes to modern and contemporary architecture, obviously there are so many lesser known sites exist that are architecturally magnificent. Can you briefly explain to our viewers some sites that one should not miss when they visit Sri Lanka? I think um, I would, I would, uh, I mean, my presentation, I think, would be a, a mix of things uh, as I sort of talk to you about what was modern and what's not. Uh, because a lot of the modern buildings uh, in Sri Lanka are essentially still very much in use and accessing them becomes a little bit more complex other than of course for a hotel that might, that, that, a building that's such as a hotel which might be uh, accessible uh, to people uh, so I'm just going to take you take take you take you through um, an experience where if you visited a modern building then perhaps there could be other older buildings that you might want to visit uh, in and around the place uh, and sort of to connect with uh, Dr. Kure's uh, conversation about an architecture uh, that uh, is made up uh, of an architecture of the landscape, uh, I'd like to show the first slide that I have presented, which is uh, the estate bungalow at Polontalava near Nikabaratia. Uh, it belongs to the National Livestock Development Board. Uh, and occasionally they let you uh, visit it uh, from time to time if you make uh, a call uh, and, and ask nicely, uh, the person uh, occupying this building um, would let you uh, go in. Now, this was built in uh, about 1965 by Jeffrey Bauer uh, with, uh, with an input from his uh, then Danish uh, collaborator, uh, Ulrich Plesner. It's an extraordinary house for a modern Sri Lankan, contemporary Sri Lankan building. As you can see, uh, a, a huge concrete uh, beam uh, is made to uh, link two rocks that were on site and a roof is slung between the two of them and that becomes the main sitting room. The rest of the uh, bedrooms, uh, which I don't have pictures of because they're quite private, uh, are actually built amongst the rocks. So the story is that Jeffrey Bava was asked to design a house for a uh, plantation manager by the then owners of that estate, Bauer and Company. Uh, and he and his, uh, and his colleague, um, Ulrich Plesner went on to the site and they suddenly found that uh, there was this extraordinary site of rocks and things like that. And inspired, uh, they say, by Jeffrey Bawa's uh, uh, familiarity with Sri Lankan cave and rock architecture. And of course, the Kadigava Raja Mahavihara, which is right next to it, um, they began to build, build on, rather than make a plan and take it there and build it, they began to construct the building uh, literally on site. Now, this is in the northwestern province. It's quite far from most other places. Um, but if you are in the area, if you're in the northwestern province, there's something else I'd like to bring your attention to. And these, of course, is really uh, Dr. Pure's, uh, Pure's sort of uh, uh, territory. Uh, but I'd like to uh, show you uh, something that I have noticed coming myself, having grown up in that area. Uh, uh, in a place called Variapola, uh, close to the old medieval city of Panduaswara. Uh, there's a whole lot of temples that are what you call Tampita Viharas, which I think was also very much a part of uh, an inspiration for modern architecture in Sri Lanka, buildings that are simply built on columns uh, with a building sitting on top of them, very much in the modernist realm. If you look at Corbusier's architecture, the idea of piloti and a building raised off the landscape was very much a part of the modern conversation. And if you look at the next few slides I've put into my presentation, you'll see some of the buildings that are in that northwestern province, the Big Area Tampita Vihara, uh, an extraordinary building, very similar to what uh, Dr. Kure showed uh, in Jesundara Ramya in Dambadenia, uh, also, also in the northwestern province, but this beautiful building um, uh, with rock, uh, a stone piloti, um, on the uh, stone piloti 
um, on the uh, uh, and, and and a structure on top uh, is very much uh, part of the campaign. We have the next slide. And this is a, a, a tiny little Tampita Vihara in the most primitive of the Tampita Vihara traditions. Uh, you can kind of see the little rocks on which uh, this this temple is built. Uh, there's a shrine room and a sort of ante room in front of it. Uh, it's the Kolambagama uh, Tampita Vihara. And it's got this rock wall around the complex. Uh, and in the old days, they say that it was really to keep um, uh, sort of wild creatures and all away from it. Uh, so this whole tradition is an ancient tradition in the area. Next slide. Um, and this is the Doraba with the Tampita Vihara, also very close to Kolambagama and Bingiria. Again, piloti columns and a building on top. Now, there are various theories as to why this might be the case. But if you are ever in the northwestern province, it's wonderful to be able to say, pick up the uh, Register of Ancient Monuments, which is sometimes available with the archaeological department or was a wonderful document that was available with the archaeological department and go and look at this, this collection of buildings, uh, a consistent collection of buildings on many ways they are as modern as they get but a lot of them are actually from the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Next slide. Uh, uh, Lakshita, if I'm to continue, can I sort of carry on with this conversation uh, about yes, some of the sir, modern yes. and... Yes, sir, you so can So here, uh, show me that slide. Uh, can we go back to that slide? It's a candy arts and crafts center. Now, this is very interesting. The idea of columns and roofs holding up, uh, uh, columns holding up roofs was taken up by the modern architect Minette de Silva when she designed the candy arts and crafts center uh, uh, close to the lake in Candy. It's quite an important building. Unfortunately, it's not as well kept as it should be, but it's a very, very significant building uh, of the modern, uh, of the of the of the tradition of modern architecture in Sri Lanka. Uh, not built by Jeffrey Bava, but another very, very important modern architect, uh, Minet de Silva. She, she did a lot of uh, a lot of other structures as well. Uh, amongst them, uh, Dr. Kure knows about it. There's the remnants of a tiny hotel that she did in Syria. It's very much inside the archaeological zone now, but there was one, one room left, which Minette had done, uh, which was also inspired by uh, the ancient architecture of Sri Lanka, but interpreting it in a modern way. Now, having come to the Kandy district, I again uh, have close connections to the district, and my own experience of the district is really about uh, looking at uh, another kind of temple uh, or complex of temples that I have been interested in. And these are the temples which are centered around a uh, processional path. Uh, so around Kandy and in fact uh, in other parts of the country as well, uh, there are a series of uh, temples uh, or uh, temples to gods or devalas which are centered around a processional path. Uh, the most famous of them, of course, are Lanka, Tilaka, Ambaka, and Gabla Denia. So next slide, please. Uh, but the lesser known ones of these uh, processional path temples uh, is this Vegiriya temple. On the left-hand side, you actually see the temple itself. And in the center photograph, you can actually see what is known as the Singhasana, the, 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 the a, a little structure that's at the end of the processional path to which a procession made up of elephants and drummers and dancers would carry the image of the god uh, during festivals uh, for as an act of worship. The right hand side shows the very, very simple uh, um, uh, image house and stupa that is in the cave of the Vegiriya temple. For me, it's an extraordinary structure and still very much a living structure where people actually go there to keep, keep their vows and the temple procession takes place every year. Uh, and it, this happens in the month of September usually. And this is a Natha Devala or temple to the god Natha. Um, and, and there's a whole tradition of who Natha is and so on. But still, it's an extraordinary uh, tradition. And the next few slides I will show you are all temples that are within walking distance virtually uh, or in Kandy, uh, which actually have a processional path centered on it. 
The Dodangwana Devala that you see here has an extraordinary processional path, which I don't have a picture of, which is um, a series of Meshuaferia or Na trees that line the path. And at the end of that path is the Singhasana and the, and the Parahara or the procession takes place every year in that path. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now, this, of course, is the classic Gadala Denia. This is part of the Three Temples tour, which I think some people take, uh, certainly local people take, and occasionally foreigners take as well. And what you see on the left-hand side is the 14th or 15th, uh, 14th century, built in the 1300s, 14th century Gadala Denia temple. Uh, it's mostly built in the, uh, what we would call the Dravidian style, a stone gedige or a stone uh, temple. Uh, but on the right hand side is the Singhasana, again at the end of the processional path where the god is taken almost for an outing on top of an elephant. And these structures still exist and the, and the processions take place. The next slide please. Another very famous temple, the Lankatilaka temple. And here I'm showing you the side of the Devala. The other side, of course, is, the, is, is where the Buddha's shrine is. But this is the shrine to the god Vishnu. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you see the Devala itself with the Lankatilaka temple uh, behind it. And on the left-hand side is the, is the Singhasana. In these photographs, decorated for the procession uh, that took a couple to, took place a couple of years ago. These photographs were taken two years ago. Uh, this year we weren't allowed to go to the, the festival, but uh, two years ago I could still go to the festival, and you can see decorated for the festival because it's a living tradition. It's a living temple. So while the temples were built in the uh, 14th century, in 13, in the case of uh, 1375, uh, when Kampala was the capital of Sri Lanka. Uh, but here, decorated for the festival. The next slides, sorry, uh, shows the procession itself. Now, of course, as processions, the candy procession takes precedence and all tourists will go and see the candy procession in the season. But if they stay on for a month, uh, do a little tour about, of the country and stay on for a month, you will begin to see these village processions. They're actually quite remarkable. If you look at it, everyone's in their traditional costumes, and in a way, the architecture begins to live the life it's supposed to be. And for me, uh, this particular group of temples with these processions still taking place thousands of years on as a living tradition is quite an extraordinary experience. And I think it's something that you should miss. And if you want, if you miss a summer holiday and you want a September holiday in Sri Lanka, this happens in September and it's well worth the trip to, I mean, this, the, the processions take place for about seven nights uh, and you could visit a different temple uh, on each night. Uh, most of them within literally walking distance or driving distance of each other. Uh, and you have the full panoply of elephants and drummers and dancers and dressed up Gandhian chieftains. All of this happening within these extraordinary architectural spaces. And I think very few people know it. Villagers just simply come to see the temple, to, to, to see the Paraharas. Uh, outsiders hardly come and it's something it's a really wonderful intimate experience uh, of Sri Lankan village life taking place in this extraordinary 600 year old building 600 year old architecture next slide uh, and another uh, temple that has this kind of thing on the top, top left hand side uh, is the Singhasana decorated for the Ambaka Devala the Perahara and Ambaka, of course, again, one of the three temples that people tend to visit, but part of the processional path, the processional path temples. Uh, it's an open pavilion, uh, which, of course, has led to, uh, to ins has gone on. And on the bottom left hand is the, is the open digge or the drumming hall. On the right hand side, the building itself from outside. But this has gone on to inspire uh, uh, more contemporary buildings. And in the 1920s, a Christian and Anglican church or chapel was built in the teacher training college in Peradenia, literally five kilometers from this temple. And that is still there. And you can sort of sneak in to have a look at it. Uh, the Anglican church occasionally with permission lets you have a look at it. Next slide, please. And is this beautiful uh, structure. Of course, the carvings have been probably done by the same carvers who might have worked in the tradition of Mbaka 
And you can see how the adaptation has taken place. The, the plinth has become, uh, has been carved out to create the nave for the, uh, the church. And all the carvings, although it might have lotuses and beautiful uh, uh, Sri Lankan uh, decorative motifs, have been incorporated with Christian motifs. So there are doves and crosses and uh, various symbolism of Christianity incorporated within the Leovellas and the lotuses of the Sri Lankan tradition uh, is something that you will see uh, in this quite extraordinary little chapel. Uh, it deserves a little bit more care and perhaps the Anglican church and perhaps the Sri Lankan uh, tradition to take on uh, this to, to conserve it. It's a beautiful building and very, very important in, in, the, in, in our culture because it's the way uh, the Christian tradition and the Buddhist tradition begin to meet uh, and create an architecture that is relevant uh, to Sri Lanka and uh, may have inspired all of us. And, uh, and something that an offshoot of that particular chapel designed by Reverend Gaster, who was uh, the little chapel was designed by Reverend Gaster as well. But he later on went on to design this extraordinary building, the Trinity College Chapel uh, in the heart of Kandy, again, visitable with permission, where the timber columns are replaced by these extraordinary stone columns. Started in 1925, the chapel was only finished in about 1968. Uh, and uh, in 1971, uh, the bell uh, of the chapel was fixed, uh, finally completing it uh, after almost a period of 30 years. Uh, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary building and well worth uh, visiting uh, for someone who's going up to Candy. Next slide, please. And talking of churches, this modern chapel in Bandaravala up in the hills uh, is also an important structure that was built by Jeffrey Bauer, uh, made out of local stone, uh, sort of very much in the tradition, uh, if you look at it in terms of what it looks like, it kind of feels like uh, sort of uh, almost like a Spanish church, but it's made out of stone. But if you walk into the place, next slide, uh, it's an extraordinary piece of architecture. On one side, there's a solid wall on which there are terracotta carvings of the Stations of the Cross that were designed by uh, Barbara Sanzoni, who's very famous for her handlooms in Sri Lanka, but was also a great artist. And, and, and uh, she, along with her friend Lucky Senanayaka uh, and Donald Friend, who was an Australian artist working at the time, uh, designed and made some of these uh, wonderful terracotta works and on the left hand side is Jeffrey Bauer's work of these windows which show the three crosses on which Christ and the two, and, and, and the two, uh, two, two uh, thieves were crucified and they become the windows looking at a spectacular view uh, into the valley in Bandaravala. So it's a modern chapel um, so it kind of go, you, you, you see a tradition that goes from uh, uh, inspiration from uh, the 14th century uh, Buddhist and Devala buildings uh, to create the Peradeniya Chapel and the Trinity College Chapel and Jeffrey Bava's Chapel, which is uh, this extraordinary modern building uh, up in Bandaravala. Uh, so we do have a tradition that speaks with each other um, and, and well worth looking at. And just as a little afterthought, I want to show you another beautiful temple that I have uh, begun to appreciate lately. It's called the Galengola Image House. Uh, close to the Lanka Tilaka temple. Uh, it's actually from a, a, a different, uh, uh, what you would call a Nikaya or order of the Buddhist Sangha. So while most of the temples in the Kandy district belong to the Siam Nikaya uh, or the Siamese sect uh, founded in the 18th century, um, this one is a later sect founded in the 19th century. And in many ways, it, it kind of, you can begin to see on the left hand side, it tries to emulate Lanka Tilaka, the grand temple of the Siamese sect in this particular uh, uh, geography uh, of Kandy. But I just find the, the interior of this temple quite extraordinary. And you, you walk into the place, it's completely unexpected. Uh, all these incredible carvings, um, uh, uh, all these incredible paintings, 19th century paintings, uh, which follow the Kandyan tradition, but beautifully decorated. And on the right hand corner, you see the entrance door to the to the Vihara gate, which has an extraordinary large Buddha statue. Next slide, please. And that's what you see on the right hand side, a huge Buddha statue uh, built in the 19th century. And opposite it is this extraordinary uh, uh, 
painting a whole wall covered with uh, a thousand Buddhas. Very similar, of course, to uh, the inside of the, uh, the Rida Vihara that uh, Dr. Kure showed us a few minutes ago. So there are all these places that I feel are extraordinary gems of Sri Lankan architecture and living architecture. People still go and worship at these temples. They light lamps at these temples. They offer flowers at these temples. Uh, and, and, and they're well worth participating in. And I really hope, uh, you know, that people are inspired to visit these places. And particularly the, the candy temples that I showed you are actually a, a day's walk. You can take a day's walk around all of these temples. It's a great hike, uh, walking to these temples and the monks are often very, very friendly. Um, and of course you, you need to help them because it's very, very difficult to maintain all of these things. Uh, the Sri Lankan archeological department uh, has limited resources uh, and we can all help. We can all uh, you know, contribute towards the upkeep of these places. And by visiting them, uh, we will only help uh, keep these to, for posterity. Uh, so, there, they, so these are my experiences of uh, some of the little known places uh, of Sri Lanka. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Daswata. Before we go to our uh, viewers' questions, we have a few questions. I just want to ask uh, Dr. Kure, so as a heritage conservationist, what message would you like to convey to both local and international tourists when they visit these lesser known sites as well as the popular sites? Yes. Um, uh, yeah, as uh, architect uh, Chandra Daswas mentioned, uh, all these sites uh, are part of the living cultural heritage. Uh, so that means uh, they are not ruins as, as per se, like uh, when you go to Anuradhapura, you get uh, all these ruined structures. But uh, since they are living cultural sites, uh, so when, there should be a balance between tourism and uh, the, the ritualistic uh, the performances. So um, as tourists, if you visit, the most important thing is that you, you should not disrupt uh, the religious and living uh, practices. Um, you can enjoy and visit these sites but at the same time, you should not hurt any, uh, you know, uh, sentimental values or any other uh, cultural values of this piece. This is the most important thing. And again, as uh, architect Chandra Daswata says, I mean, these are um, sites and uh, monuments, um, you know, where there is no proper income to the, uh, the, the, the these heritage sites. So uh, the best thing is, uh, if uh, the visitors, I mean, there, there are no system of, you know, uh, entry, uh, you know, fees to these sites. Uh, most of them are, uh, they can be visited very freely. But uh, if uh, the visitors can help uh, these monks or the, 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 the residents or whatever, the, 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 mon the, the monuments which are belonging to them, uh, then that will actually help uh, you know, for the sustenance of these uh, uh, these sites, uh, because archaeology department, as uh, architect Channa says, uh, cannot uh, you know maintain and upkeep all these places uh, uh, because of their limited resources. So these are the most important thing. And uh, the other important aspects is that you should not litter these places. Uh, you should not bring an, uh, any polythene or any other uh, you know uh, foreign material to these uh, pristine. The, most of them are very pristine, and they they are scared. You know, located in um, uh, real uh, the countryside, uh, so you have to be very careful when you are uh, visiting these sites. And of course, you should not damage or touch um, of, of I mean all these uh, monuments and the fabric. So this is the message that I want to uh, pass on to the viewers. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Daswata. Uh, so we talk about the main layers of tourist attractions that have significant architectural value. But at the same time that you're talking about another layer with hidden or secret, either close proximity to the main site or further away from it. Can you briefly give us a few examples of sites like this that our, our viewers could go and visit and enjoy? Uh, well, I, I haven't, I mean, I, I haven't prepared anything beyond what I have shown you, but I think one of the things about uh, engaging with the culture as a tourist um, is to perhaps uh, engage with it um, 
take take time and um, for instance if you if you go to Kandy you have the great city of Kandy and and uh, and we we know the main monument there is the the, the temple of the truth um, and so most people would just simply go to the temple of the truth and have a look at it uh, and off they'll go to the Peradeniya gardens uh, and 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 so on and so forth but if uh, you have the time uh, Kandy is a fascinating place and and, and within Kandy, I'm just talking of a, tip, a, a, a classic example uh, it's a fascinating place because it's got all of these other uh, remember I mean it was it was the last capital uh, it, it, it and, and, and Sri Lankan life is not essentially an urban one uh, it's it's a it, it's a life that is led in villages in small villages uh, and Kandy is a classic example of of having a whole series of small villages and important monuments as around uh, centered on those villages. So if you if you just went out of Kandy uh, uh, for a day's walk or you just for a little drive outside Kandy, you can actually visit a lot of very very important monuments uh, and experience them as they should be experienced, uh, still being venerated by the local people uh, and uh, their lives are are dominated often by the temple because the village priest becomes an important advisor to most uh, most people in their daily lives and these buildings while they are very beautiful monuments are also the cultural centers of the people's lives so so looking at these things in this way is, is quite an important thing candy also has other things for instance uh, modern architecture as i said the trinity college chapel is part of candy uh, but if you went everyone goes to the peradeniya gardens but if in May you have the time, uh, in, in around March, April, if you have the time, and you visit the Peradeniya Gardens, and you went a little further on into the University of Peradeniya, an extraordinary university built uh, in the 1940s and 50s as the first proper university, um, purpose-built university in Sri Lanka. Shirley D. Alvis, the architect, uh, designed it, inspired by the monuments of Anuradhapura and Polonnaruwa. And it was also laid out with an extraordinary landscape garden, with beautiful trees and plants that come into flower in that period. Uh, so if you're ever in Kandy uh, in about March and April, uh, it's well worth going to the gardens, but also continuing your trip into the university where the, the main road drives through the university. You can take an easy walk uh, through the main drive. You don't have to go into any of the, any of the faculties themselves. But you will also, and, and that you will experience an extraordinary landscape, a, a, a little known secret of being in Kandy. So similarly, uh, if you went to Matara, for instance, or Gaul, the University of Ruhuna, Jeffrey Bava's great monument in the south, uh, might be visited and, and so on and so forth. So there are lots of places that I can say uh, you could visit. Uh, Sri Lanka is quite an extraordinary place. And if you, if you, if you get under its skin slightly, uh, uh, and off the beaten track, uh, you are bound to experience wonders that, uh, you know, sometimes we go to Europe and see us what wonderful villages and different places, and they are wonderful. Um, but Sri Lanka has its own uh, great tradition uh, of living heritage, which uh, you can engage with, uh, if, you, if only you would care to go beyond the beaten path. Yeah. Definitely, it's an amazing place. So, just um, since I have you, just a quick question. We are running close to uh, um, out of time. Uh, just just a question that I uh, we were wants to ask you. Uh, Jeffrey Bawa sites one can visit, which are not commonly known. What which ones do you recommend? Like you know that not commonly known. I think but, I think I think there are several uh, of them. Uh, as I said, the Polontala State Bangalore. I mean, I myself didn't realize that. In fact, the NLDB does let you visit it. Uh, I, I sent an Indian friend of mine, and and she uh, turned up there. And of course, they were very welcoming, and you have to pay fifty rupees or something like that and visit it. Uh, well worth going to uh, Polontala. Well worth going to uh, the Chapel of the Good Shepherd. Now, outside of those, there's also the uh, Pil uh, it's near Piliandala, near Moratua, the University of Moratua, uh, the, uh, the, um, the Subodhi uh, Center, the Center for Integral Education. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a church uh, run uh, property. Uh, it's a beautiful series of buildings that have been draped around a rubber estate uh, and it is used for uh, various retreats and uh, study programs. Uh, and often, if you go there and 
ask very nicely, they'll uh, let you let you have a look at it. Uh, uh, there's of course the, the hotels, uh, all of the hotels, uh, but Bentota itself has a series of buildings well worth looking at. The Bentota railway station, designed by Jeffrey Bauer. The Bentota police station is designed by Jeffrey Bauer. The Beruola police station designed by Jeffrey Bauer. So Bentota itself has a, a, a series of buildings, uh, public buildings, well worth visiting. And of course, it's really well known and in the public eye, but not known that when parliament is not in session, uh, you can also ask to visit the public galleries if you're a tourist. You have to take your, your, your passport, uh, go to the entrance, find out whether parliament is in session or not. If it's not in session, they often let you visit the public galleries and the interior of parliament. Quite a spectacular experience uh, to see that. Um, and in Colombo, of course, there is the uh, Sima Malaka, uh, slightly altered, but still still worth looking at. Uh, the other places I can't recommend, of course, because they're either in schools or places that you really don't uh, want to recommend that people visit. Great. But there's quite a lot of Baba. Of course, if you go into the Jeffrey Baba website, uh, there's a little bit more help about uh, what buildings might be visited uh, and how you might do that. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, before we conclude our webinar, let me thank these two wonderful gentlemen on behalf of Sri Lanka Tourism for joining with us and sharing a bit of their immense knowledge about the architectural value of some of these hidden lesser known uh, sites in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Dr. Kure. Thank you, Mr. Chandra Daswata for your valuable insights. Let me finish off our webinar with this quote. You know, whether it will be architecture, history, culture, religion, historical monuments, back with the 2,500 year old history that you like, or the natural beauty from, common, from beautiful mountains to rainfalls that you like, or from seeing the largest mammal in the ocean to the largest mammal in the land, or to the birds, the leopards, reptiles in natural wilderness or in other national parks that you like, or from the sun, sea and sand to the golden beaches that you like, all this is encompassed into this amazing island. Make sure in your must visit places, Sri Lanka is at the top because Sri Lanka truly is a paradise. We are so Sri Lanka. Are you born? <laughs>